So now comes an interesting sequence. Today I'm going to talk about mechanical design and machine design. Then no class next week. Next week is three things uh, the next two weeks. One is it's just a break. We've been going at a fast pace, so it's a break to catch your breath. Second, it's a midterm review. And so what we want you to do is you're going to be going through global evaluation. And I see that link I need to move to 2023. The global evaluation, it's not bureaucratic. It's how we make sure everybody anywhere in the network meets the same standards and has the same skills. And so over the two week cycle, we want your local instructor to check all of your preceding assignments, um, check your final project site, uh, make sure you're on track. And then we do this as, both to help move you along and also check for any special cases, problem cases. And then the exciting thing is you're all going to make a machine. Until now, the assignments have been separate. This is the opposite. This is a group assignment. So in the first part is you're going to design a mechanism. Then the second part is you're going to automate it and make a machine. And then as a group, you'll document that project. And so the final project, we want you to integrate all the skills. For this week, you can layer. So somebody can do mechanism, somebody can do low-level code, somebody can do application code, uh, somebody can build end effectors. You can divide work however you want. And in fact, you can work between labs, not just uh, within labs on that. So for this week's assignment, a machine means a mechanism a way to actuate it, automation to control a sequence of operations, and some kind of application. So it can be a fabrication tool, but it doesn't have to be. It's any combination of those attributes. The background for all of this is machine building in the Fab Lab network. So there's a video linked of a recitation of star machine builders talking about how you can make fab lab tools in the fab lab we're transitioning to a 2.0 stage where you don't go to the lab to get access to the machine you go to the lab to make the machine and the video is a tour th through lots of versions of that and i'll talk about highlights as i go through the class so to do this i'm going to talk about two topics. And both of these topics, uh, if we go here, I periodically teach a class on rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping. And so this is a class of the same depth of Fab Academy just on this one topic. So in one uh, hour, I can't, of course, cover all aspects of machine building, but can do enough to get you started on machine building this week. So I'm going to split this into two topics. First is the mechanism, and then the second is the automation. So for the mechanical design, uh, first is uh, vendors. I'm going to show you many parts from McMaster Car. But I, you don't, it's not in particular to recommend buying them there. Uh, buying them there tends to be more expensive than what you can get elsewhere, but it's more convenient. But uh, they're a good vendor. Uh, Stock Drive makes a number of precision parts. Amazon bought up a number of vendors. So Amazon Industrial, rather than consumer, um, has a growing collection of uh, machine parts. And Misumi, is a uh, vendor that makes lots of specialized machine parts we make uh, a lot of use of. 
this, this is a link to a good reference, just some general principles before we start in in uh, detail. So uh, um, there's stress and strain. Uh, stress you can remember as press and strain as pain. So when you apply stress, a force per area on a material, strain is the relative response of it. And if a, a typical curve looks like this. So there's an elastic range where you, the material, if you push on it, it retraces. There's a, a, a region where it's nonlinear. Then when you go beyond that, you start deforming it so it doesn't retrace, which is beginning to damage the material, and eventually it fails. And so we want to stay down here in the linear range where materials, we don't move them so far and you damage them. And as you get to higher forces in the machines, that's an important uh, constraint. So stiffness is the slope of stress strain. Um, strength is how far you can push a material before it fails. Uh, Maxwell criterion, it comes from uh, a, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but a classic paper from 1864, which is if you make a structure, it has degrees of freedom and it has constraints. And so if you make a bookcase that looks like that, uh, it's going to wobble because if, if you shear the bookcase, all of these joints have the same length. And so uh, this ha doesn't have enough constraints for the degrees of freedom. But if you cross brace it, if you just add tendons in the back diagonally, you've added enough constraints so that the structure isn't a mechanism. We're going to design mechanisms to move, but we don't want them to move in ways that aren't constrained. And so the Maxwell criterion is the trade off between those. Um, uh, friction is going to be very important this week. Um, spalling is what you get when you run the same material over itself and you get grooves and little balls up forming. Uh, and so I'll talk about bearings. Uh, one of the worst things for this week is hysteresis. So if you have, for example, um, a threaded rod, and uh, we'll see uh, examples of this shortly. And then you have a, a, a threaded uh, nut on it. And so when the threaded rod turns, you move the nut. The issue is if we zoom in on a tooth, uh, if this is the threaded rod and then this is the nut, um, if it's touching here and then there's a little gap here, then when you change direction, the nut moves from one side to the other and you get an offset. So if you look at the position when you go in one direction, you, 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 the position is offset when you go in the other direction. And so we obviously don't want a machine to have a different position when you go forward or backwards. And so a lot of effort goes into fighting uh, hysteresis. Uh, force loops I've mentioned before, but are going to matter more this week. Let's say you want to do precision machining. So he here's our end mill. Um, it goes in a collet. Um, the collet goes in a spindle. <clears throat> the spindle goes into a, a, an axis. Uh, that goes in in a transverse axis. Uh, we get to a bed that holds stock, uh, um, and then eventually we get here. And we care about that spacing down to high resolution, but it's defined by this whole pathway. So the force loop is the opposite of your end effector and whatever you're doing, painting or milling or drawing or printing. The force loop is everything that connects them. And we want to keep that <clears throat> generally as short as possible and as rigid as possible. Um, elastic averaging is if you want to make a constraint, if you over constrain it, that's not necessarily mathematically, but 
if you add more constraints, they average and reduce the error. And uh, kinematic coupling is a very handy thing. Uh, you're going to see uh, many examples of kinematic coupling today. Uh, we're going to add and remove things. So you might change a head in a modular machine or move the bed, but you want to align it. And so kinematic coupling looks simple, but they're, they're, they're not. So if you look at this image, for example, here, there's three ball bearings and there's three rods, and you just slap it together uh, to, to mount it. Um, uh, but the, uh, what's going on is a, a ball can move in one axis, but if you have three channels and three balls, there's only one solution. There's only one place they can go that satisfies all of them. So even though you just slap it together, you've actually aligned it to micron resolution. Um, Jason, uh, I don't recall which page. I, I, I'm showing a number of pages. I don't recall which page you're asking for. If you describe the page, I'll, I'll find a link for you. Yeah, sorry, Neil. The um, the one you first started with, it was your rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping page. I looked oh. through the schedule and didn't see anything um, like that. This one? Sorry, this page? Uh, no, you said you taught a class on rapid oh. prototyping oh, of rapid okay. prototyping. Uh, yeah, that's, sorry, that that's this class. I'll put that in the chat. That's just a, a, a seminar I pe periodically teach at MIT. Got you. Thank you. Yeah, it just seems yep. really helpful right now. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. So these are some general principles on machine building. So to make a machine, you need to pick a material. Um, we uh, one of the materials we use is called HDPE, which is high density polyethylene, which is the material, for example, of cutting boards. It's reasonably stiff. Uh, it machines uh, really easily. Um, uh, we use aluminum extrusions. I'll talk about aluminum you can machine on shopbot type machines. Um, we use rubber or foam typically to absorb energy or for damping. Um, Garolite is a lovely material for machine building. It, it's, it's a friendly composite. So it's a fiber reinforced material, but it's not hazardous to machine. So you can use that when you need uh, uh, stiffer materials. Uh, there's some use of wood, but in general, I'd stay away from wood in machine building because it swells um, uh, with temperature or humidity. Uh, cement has a surprising role. Uh, um, casting cement is a way to make heavy stiff structures to add rigidity to a machine and then if you need um, higher temperature or really hard materials uh, there are multiple ceramics um, generally we avoid adhesives because we want machines to be disassemblable uh, just as a general principle um, nuts and bolts are surprisingly non-trivial so uh, one of the banes of machines are things walking. So generally, whenever you have a nut in a machine, you want to elastically load it so that the nut doesn't uh, move as it vibrates. So lock nuts have um, um, uh, a little deformable material that prevents it from vibrating. And then you can get um, all sorts of um, uh, uh, lock washers that the, the, what these washers do is put a little elastic force so that the um, nut and bolt don't walk. walk. Um, uh, we'll use lots of bolts. Again, you can vary them in the types of heads in the sockets and how you drive them. Uh, a nice part is if you have, for example, a 3D printed part, you can't screw into it directly reliably because the screw will strip the plastic. And so these are threaded inserts and you poke them in with the soldering iron and they melt into the plastic, but then you screw into them is a convenient way to screw into plastics. Uh, rivets are a great way. You get a gun and pop the rivet in. If you need to make lots of joints, rivets are a nice way to hold things together. 
Uh, and then uh, these pins exist because when you snap things together, um, uh, you, often there's one degree of freedom you need to take up to disassemble it. And a common way to do it is using these sort of pins uh, to hold that last degree of freedom. You need to make typically a frame for a machine. So uh, these are channels and there are a number of vendors of these that you um, cut to size and you snap together. And this is a common way to make uh, machine frames. Uh, you can get uh, plastic extrusions, um, uh, T-slots, um, then go into these channels and have all sorts of fasteners to hold machines together. Um, yeah, Ricardo's noting magnets for easily removable. And a nice way to build machines, uh, this machine is self-aligning. So this is Nadia and Jonathan. And this, this is a snap joint that when you put it in, takes up all the degrees of freedom. So here, rather than fasteners, they, they machine it with the joints you need to hold it together. So the whole thing is self-aligning for the framing. Then drives are how you get the forces distributed. So something is going to move in the machine, something makes it move, and the drive is what get, transmits the forces. So gear design is surprisingly subtle. There are many types of gears. So if you just take um, gear teeth meshing, uh, the, what you don't do is do what I drew, which is if you have teeth that are just triangles, they, they slap against each other and they're all on or all off. So uh, the most common de gear design is what's called an involute gear. And when you mesh an involute gear, there's a point of contact. And as the gear turns, this point of contact moves continuously. And so you get a smooth, continuous transition rather than a discontinuous uh, slapping together. So that, that's an involute gear. Uh, a variant of involute gears is cycloidal gears. And this, this is from Jens, who we'll talk about. And so this shows you cycloidal gear meshing. Uh, cycloidal gears are easier to machine. They have easier clearances. Um, they're not, um, they don't have a uniform uh, pressure angle, which is a, a detail that, um, of the angle that, of the force that for these applications uh, is fine. Um, then, there are many other angles of gears. So helical gears are um, angled so they're continuously transmitting force rather than having separate teeth. Um, herringbone gears do that in two axes that are self-aligning. And so for extra credit, if you've ever seen the Citroen logo on the car, it's because they use a herringbone transmission. Um, then we get to gear train. So a planetary gear, um, is a central gear with um, uh, gears around it uh, to do reduction. Uh, rack and pinion is a common solution uh, where you have a, a, um, a motor turning the pinion and it drives the rack. And so that, if we go back to um, Jens's machine, uh, this is a large format machine I'll be saying more about. and here's the long axis that drives it. And so Jens makes those himself. So he machines the rack and then puts a pinion on a motor. And then that gives you uh, the long axis. Uh, a common way to transmit forces in machine is to use belts. So these are rubbery belts, um, but they're reinforced. So they're flexible in um, a transverse axis, but you can't stretch them. And then these mate with teeth. And so that's a standard way to transmit uh, forces in the machines. Things like a, you'll see them commonly used in uh, 3D printers. Uh, a neat way to transmit forces is this is thread, but it's a very special thread. This is a Kevlar thread. 
that's actually stronger than steel. It's a high performance polymer. So it's a very low stretch thread. Um, this doesn't have teeth that mesh with a, um, um, a sprocket. So when you use the belt, um, you need uh, a sprocket to me mesh with the belt to drive it. Um, if you use the threads, a nice solution is what's called a capstan drive. Uh, so this is an example from Quentin. And so if we zoom in here, the thread doesn't have teeth, but what's going on here is the motor drives this capstan drive where this is at, this is driven, this is passive, but by wrapping it around multiple times, it's doing two things. One thing it's doing is increasing the friction so it doesn't slip. And the second thing is if you, it takes a little while to study it to get it. If you look at this routing, um, if you just had, for example, threads and you wrapped the thread around the threads, as the motor turns, uh, it would move up and down. With this design, the thread always leaves and enters at the same height, and it doesn't move. Um, uh, let's see, Ricardo is adding a link to a capstan equation to figure out how many turns you need in a capstan. Um, and so even though it seems sort of analog and qualitative, the capstan drive can be a surprisingly good constraint that <clears throat> on, excuse me, an axis like this, um, you can't by hand beat the capstan drive. There's enough friction that it holds it against your uh, sort of manual force of you pulling on it. So uh, threads and capstan drive are a really convenient way to transmit forces because it's very easily scalable across sizes. And then, sorry, if we go back to um, here, um, and then if we go through the design, so here, here's the capstan drive. Um, I'll talk about the bearings and then uh, here's the return pulley for it. And so this is really a versatile and flexible way to do it. Um, chains are used uh, when you want to transmit much larger forces, like say drive a motorcycle, um, but the force transmission is much less smooth. Um, um, then let's see, uh, threaded rods are exactly that. They're rods with threads, but in particular, uh, these are made with high resolution threads uh, and in hard materials designed for um, driving then nuts. And so uh, um, these are special nuts that are designed to minimize backlash. And so they're elastically loaded. So one of these um, drive rods with one of these anti-backlash nuts um, turns rotary motion from a motor to linear motion uh, moving down the axis. Uh, a surprising hack is a threadless where if you look at these nuts, they're all at an angle and it's a little bit like the kinematic mount uh, if it, there's no threads on the rod, but these hardened nuts pushed against it, if you turn it, uh, force it to spiral. And so you can use that as a way to make a threadless motion system, again, reducing hysteresis. Uh, and then harmonic drives are a really surprising idea. These are commonly used um, in robot joints. Uh, a harmonic drive is a, an elastic part, so a, a, a metal ring. Then you have this uh, cam that's asymmetric, and the inner ring and outer ring differ by the number of teeth, which could be a single tooth. And so as the cam rotates around and as this elastic, elastic thing meshes, if they differ by just one tooth, every lap around, rotates the whole thing by only a single tooth. And so it can take, remember motors are happy spinning at a higher RPM. It takes the happy motor RPM and turns it into high resolution, uh, high torque, slower motion. 
Uh, and so those are uh, harmonic drives. Um, let's see, Yu Yuichi is act, um, asking about the diameter of the thread. Uh, the, uh, of these, let's see, let me make one other note. Um, uh, if you go to this um, thread, any of these are fine. A, you know, a, a, on the scale, uh, let's see, it depends on the machine you're making. But if you're making a USB powered motor, any of these are um, fine uh, uh, for the strength. And similar to these is if you look at um, like low stretch fishing line, uh, a fishing line is designed to not stretch. And in particular, there's a high performance fishing line that's fairly similar to these um, uh, Kevlar strings. So um, we then need to guide the motion. So one way to guide the motion is uh, these are precision shafts that a bearing can go down. Um, you can get rails that you ride on and you can buy those, they're fairly expensive. I'm going to show you ways to make them. Um, uh, for lower resolution machines, you can get slides that are used in furniture, but not for um, high performance machines. Uh, couplers can be essential. So what this is doing is you have a, an axis driving the machine and you have a motor driving it. Um, if they're slightly misaligned, everything will bind up and seize. And so these couplers um, are very stiff rotationally. Uh, the motor turn exactly couples into the axis turn, but they have an angular degree of freedom. And so they take up a little bit of misalignment uh, between the motor and the axle. And a good rule of thumb is before you automate a machine, um, just move it by hand. And if you can't move it by hand, it's unlikely you'll be able to automate it. You want to be able to feel the motion in the machine. Uh, so then um, uh, bearings uh, are used throughout machine building. So these are classic ball bearings that let you have something rigid and have a rotary shaft. And thrust bearings are the opposite. Thrust, um, uh, ball bearings have an axial rotation. Thrust bearings have a normal rotation. So if you have something um, where, where the force is normal rather than axial, you use a thrust bearing. Um, you can buy linear bearings. Um, these are bearings that are designed to move on a linear shaft. And in fact, if we go to, uh, uh, this was uh, on a X-ray tool I bought in my lab. This is a linear bearing and you can see the balls uh, recirculating in the bearing as it runs. Um, rotary bearings like these are used for um, uh, less resolution in machine building, but uh, rotary loads. Um, sleeves are, these don't have recirculating bearings. Um, it, it's a slightly softer material that's oil impregnated and um, uh, it, it, uh, it's designed to not need any lifetime maintenance, and you can use those to make um, uh, sliding uh, bearings on a, a shaft. Uh, um, pillow blocks are a deformable material you move against. And then one of the things that's really helped machine building is the commoditization of skateboard bearings. And so these sort of bearings used in uh, things like skateboards have brought the cost way down and they're so competitive, the quality way up. And so now you can, it can be a dollar a bearing to get these kinds of bearings. And so with those, uh, in fact, let me make a note. A common way we use those, if we go back to the capstan drive here, 
is uh, uh, let's see what images there are. Uh, this is a common approach we use where uh, this is an extrusion and uh, the extrusion you're looking at, um, you can buy the extrusion and you can also print the extrusion. So um, uh, you can 3D print the extrusion, but I think, let's see, Quentin, you also have an access, um, Oh, let's see. Let's let me go to here. Um, Machines Fab Cloud IO. Oh, let's see, Quentin. I'm looking for the. Okay, yes, this is what I was looking for. Um, uh, uh, this is an all printed access where instead of buying the access, the um, uh, uh, you, you you print the axis, which can be uh, custom designed to what you're mating it to. And that's limited to the print bed size, but you can join multiple ones together, or you can use a moving bed to make a longer axis. But these extrusions from Misumi, for example, are quite cheap. And so in this axis, uh, Quentin is making uh, parts that um, snap onto it. And so what's going on here is um, you can get the uh be bearings in wheels and the wheels can either have a v-shape or a cylindrical shape and so this is using a tapered wheel that fits in the slot in the extrusion and then if you look at this structure that's a a, a slight flexure and so the flexure is providing an elastic force that holds it onto it. And so this is a little bit like the carriage that holds a roller coaster on a track. And so by doing this, you have the uh, cheap extrusion, you have these cheap bearing wheels, then you have this flexural carriage, and then you have a thread or a belt to do the force transmission. And I'd say this is the most uh, flexible, versatile, easiest way um, this is scalable to big or small axes and is a very easy way to make your own motion systems. Um, uh, there's a question about 3D printed bearings. Uh, boy, I would stay away from it in that you need a really high performance 3D printer to make a remotely good bearing. And um, uh, the uh, bearings have just gotten so cheap and so commodified that uh, I would, that's something where I would just keep a good inventory in your lab of uh, these, these commodity bearings that they used to be much more expensive, but the, the kind of skateboard bearings, it's you know, at, at a dollar or less a bearing, I would just keep an inventory in the lab. Um, so those are um, bearings, a key topic. Um, uh, Wheels, you can make your own wheels, but an interesting kind of wheel to be aware of is an Omnibot is a wheel of wheels. Uh, this is something you can make. And so Omnibots, what's nice about these are these are wheels that can go in more than one direction. And so they're very handy if you wanna make uh, wheels that don't just have to turn, but the wheels themselves can change angle. Um, see. Walter added a link. Oh, yeah. So again, examples of these, um, these sort of bearings are environmentally sealed. They're lifetime lubricated, great tolerances um, uh, for bearings. Uh, an important thing to be keep track of is routing cables. You're going to have, for example, wires. You might have plumbing, and you don't want that flapping all over the place. So uh, cable ties we use to hold bundles together, those have increasingly been replaced by these hook and loop, uh, uh, trade name is Velcro. Um, so uh, you can get individual ones, you can get just tape of this, and we use that to make bundles to route uh, wiring through the structures together. Uh, and so once you have all of these building blocks, then mechanisms are how you build 
systems out of them. So I, I showed before this thesis on flexures. Uh, let's let this load. This, this is a reminder that uh, this is has no conventionally moving parts, slides, bearings, but one beam bends, two does parallel transport, nesting it does linear motion, and then nesting those in pairs. And so all of this is an XY stage. This moves in two axes very smoothly. The downside is its range of travel is about a third of the size of the structure. The upside is you don't need to buy any parts for this. You just machine these flexures to make motion. Uh, so with that, you can make stages. This was a, um, uh, uh, a uh, instructor project uh, doing that. Uh, open flexure is a project making using them to make high performance microscopes, for example. Uh, Series elastic is an important concept. Uh, let's say I want a robot to walk. I can have the motor directly move the legs uh, and each motor motion makes the robot uh, move a little bit. Or what I can do is I can push on a spring and have the spring push on the leg. And so the difference is if I connect directly to the leg, I'm setting the position. If I push on a spring, I'm setting the force, not the position. And that's what your muscles do. Your muscles don't set the position of your leg. They set the force on your leg and you vary that. And by pushing through a spring, you can make a smoother motion. So that's called serial series elastic. Linkages are how you transmit forces. And there is a crazy number of linkages. If you pick any subcategory, all of these are one version to get some sort of motion into another kind of motion. And so this is a massive gallery of types of linkages. Um, he, uh, closely related are, this is collections of movements of uh, what uh, it's almost the same thing. It's uh, ways something can move, uh, push on something to move something of like linear to reciprocating, uh, for example. Uh, Whipple tree is if you want to add forces, this is like a mechanical calculator. It, if you have bulls pulling a cart, some pull more than others. And if you rigidly connect them, they would be skewing. And so what this does is it adds forces from multiple sources, but the forces don't not all need to be the same. Uh, pantograph is uh, either increasing or reducing. So by making it asymmetrical, a small motion can be a big motion or a big motion can be shrunk down um, to a small motion. Uh, delta bots are um, an interesting mechanism where you have three linear axes that let you do three, three axis uh, positioning in space. Um, hexapods are um, an interesting kind of robot to get six degrees of freedom with linear motion. Uh, Core XY was developed by a former student, Alain Moyer. Now it's used all over machine building. This is a neat idea where instead of moving the motors, you keep the motors fixed and then you just route tendons. And if you think about this design, if you move the motors both in the same direction, the carriage moves in the X axis. If you move the motors in the opposite direction, it moves in the Y axis. And so it lets you reduce the moving mass by uh, keeping the motors fixed. And uh, Quentin just noticed that there's something there's an extension that the, to this, which is core X, Y, Z, where you do the same thing in all three axes. So you keep motors fixed, but by routing the tendons with the bearings, it lets you have fixed motors make X, Y, and Z motion. And that reduces the moving mass, which lets it move faster, um, can be higher resolution, uh, all of that. Uh, SARS is where you make a mechanism by, by uh, moving hinges a, a, as the constraint for the axis. 
Uh, hang printer is an interesting example where you hang a, um, let's see, you'd simply suspend the printer in space. And what it's doing is it uh, going back to elastic averaging, if you just have three tendons going to it, it's still floppy. And so you'll see there's tendons going down and up in multiple directions. And that adds enough constraints that it fixes in space where this printer is. And so it lets you print over an enormous uh, volume. Uh, Chuck Hoberman is a colleague at Harvard who's a master of Mexic mechanism design. And he designs mechanisms like I'm describing, but on the scale of, for example, stadiums. Uh, and then I, I've shown before, but Theo Jansen uh, creates strand beasts that are these gorgeous mechanisms that, that are, um, are creatures, uh, nearly living creatures. So what I want you to do is think of a machine and the first half assignment is design the mechanical parts and move the machine by hand before you add motors to it. And then because this is a group project, build a group page on the group assignment and then separately describe which part of it you did. So now we have a um, mechanism, now we need to automate it. So now we need motors, sensors, and controllers. And so that's the second part of class. So you could make a machine. And so Nadia uh, with Jonathan made this machine. It does one thing. It was an early version of a PCB mill. You could break it into modules. So this is, uh, 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 Nadia and uh, James. And what they're going to do here is each of these modules is one degree of freedom. Then they bolt together. And then in this case, what they're doing is they're making a hot wire cutter. We had a NASA visitor that needed airfoils. So by adding these modules, you, you then build a machine that's uh, modular. Uh, Nadia did a thesis on that, and uh, this is a version of, for not high performance machine building, but for introductory machine building, laser cutting axes. She's going to use uh, linear guide rails. Uh, uh, in this case, she's using stepper motors with lead screws. And then all of that lets you make an axis. And then you can assemble these axes together. And then these were projects of this is a coffee stirrer, this is a marble light show, this is a multi axis hot wire cutter, uh, this is a painting project drawing, uh, more hot wire. Let's see, this was a lathe. Uh, this is ketchup plotting, uh, cocktail making. Uh, this was um, uh, vegetable slicing. <laughs> so th these are all examples of using modular machine building to make machines for Fab Academy. This link is a colleague at MIT who's one of the gods of machine building, Alex Slocum. Uh, and, um, oh, let's see, it looks like that link has moved. Um, up, I'll update the link for that one. But it, in it, he goes through error budgets. So if you take my sketch of the force loop, Every step in the force loop adds some error to the machine. And in, in this, he goes through calculating how you add all of those errors together to get the performance of the whole machine. Uh, these next links are, last week, 
I talked about controlling motors. This week, I'm going to, in two weeks, talk about lots of sensors. And then in two more weeks, I'm going to talk about uh, networks. So once you've made a machine, let's say it's a, a drawing machine, you have to get, create a path. This is an example of a, a machine, a kind of machine I have in my lab, where if you look behind the machine, the, the, there's a casting that's one foot thick and about 10 feet tall. And that's the backbone of the machine. It's making the machine so stiff that no matter how you machine, nothing ever moves. So, so in that case, the path is static. But a distinction is this is a water jet cutter that cuts with a jet of water. And as you move the machine, as you move the head, the uh, jet of water bends because the head is moving. And so that means where it cuts isn't where the head is, but it's where the jet lands. And so for a machine like that, the tool path is dynamic rather than static because it needs to account for the deformation of, of it. So then next comes open versus closed loop. So here's a shop bot and this one costs $17,000. Uh, here's another shop bot and this one costs $23,000. And the difference between those is the lower cost machine is feed forward. You send steps to a stepper and hope it, it does what you sent. The more expensive one, so um, the simple one, uh, you have a stepper motor on an axis and you just do a certain number of steps and hope you end up here. The more expensive one actually measures the position of the motor and uses that to not feed forward, but actually to feed back. You actually measure where the motor went to. And by doing feedback control, it does many things. Uh, it lets you machine faster, move more quickly, and not worry about errors from missing steps. And so, in general, it's much better to work closed loop than open loop. You don't need to do that if you're far away from the limit of loading the machine. But if you're pushing speed or resolution, closed loop is much better. It used to be expensive, but now it's much easier to do that with just uh, sensors we're going to talk about in two weeks and a microcontroller. You can make a complete open loop system. So then, that leads to the control logic. So let's say this is a rack and pinion axis. We're here and we want to get to here. And you can tell the motor to make a step. So how do you do that? Well, the obvious thing you do is um, you turn on the controller, tell the motor to start stepping. Um, and then when you get to where you want to be, you turn it off. So that's the obvious thing to do. And um, so uh, Ricardo asks, how expensive are closed loop controllers? Uh, the answer to that is they used to be thousands of dollars, but now they're, you've been making them in this class. A $1 microcontroller is enough to implement a closed loop controller. And I'll talk more about that right now. So this is called bang bang control and it's a terrible idea. The reason it's terrible is uh, when you start this, there's a huge surge of acceleration as you start the motor moving. So the whole machine lurches and draws a lot of current. And then when you get to the end, there's a big deacceleration as you slam it off and you uh, overshoot. So you don't want to just, unless, the machine is very lightweight. You don't want to just slam it on and off. You want to um, ramp it. So a PID is a proportional integral derivative. And so in a PID controller, 
you, you take three signals. One is the error between where you are and where you want to be. Um, one takes the derivative in time. So it measures the rate of change. One takes the integral in time, which adds up the error. And then you combine all of these. And so the, the error term drives you to where you want to be. The derivative term prevents you from uh, making changes too quickly. And then the integral term um, takes up the error to finally get to where you need to be. And so there are many, many pages on uh, PID controllers. They're very easy to implement mathematically. And so that's one step better. Uh, however, what a PID controller can't do is what's called mod model predictive control. So if, if you're driving down the highway and there's a traffic light down here and you see the traffic light turn to yellow um, and that you know it's going to turn to red, long before you get to the, to the traffic light, um, you begin slowing down in your car. You're doing what's called model predictive control. You know the rate at which your car can deaccelerate, and you start deaccelerating long before you actually have an error signal that you're at the where you need to stop. So to do that, you actually need to make a model of the machine. And so more powerful controllers do model predictive control. And then finally, uh, increasingly, all of this is just done with machine learning. And so you actually train a machine learning model to figure out how to control your machine. So this goes well beyond this class, but this is a class I teach on mathematical modeling um, where I talk about uh, all of these algorithms. So to start, you might just be doing bang bang control, but you need to be aware that these go beyond it. So then the next thing is time in the machine. So it, um, a, the, um, in a moment, I'll say more about tiny G is a standard controller in a machine. So uh, this is a centralized controller uh, that might be in your 3D printer or milling machine. And it can do what it can do, but it, you can't change it. So increasingly, we build machines out of networks. So Alan, who, who invented tiny uh, who invented Core XY and Shaper Tools, did a thesis on the idea of machine networks. And uh, this was a thesis from one of my students. And so in here, what we do is uh, each degree of freedom in the machine is a node in a network. And then you build a distributed controller over them. So uh, let's say we have an XYZ machine. Uh, the traditional way you do it is you have a centralized controller everything plugs into, and you can only do what the controller can do. Uh, increasingly, what we do is we take um, all of the, the degrees of freedom in the machine and we put them on a network. But now, if we want to add some sensors or new end effectors, we add them to the network. So in that case, the machine control it is, it's a virtual machine, meaning there isn't a fixed controller in the machine. The machine is a network, and then you use software to coordinate it, which I'll talk about. Once you do that, you need to coordinate the machine. And so, um, let's see, the, if we come over to here, uh, we, so, we have one motor controlling the x-axis. Uh, we have a motor controlling the y-axis. And so if we just want to move in a diagonal, uh, each of these motors is running separately. But to move in the diagonal, they need to coordinate their behavior. So microscopically, if it's a stepper motor, they're each making small steps. And so you need to coordinate when the x-axis makes a step versus the y-axis. 
If you go this way, Y never steps. If you go this way, X never steps. If you go in the diagonal, they step at the same rate and you need to continuously vary that. So one way to do it is to send out broadcast messages. One is to set, send a message that says at a certain time, I want you to do a certain thing. Um, one is to handshake where the motor tells you when it's done. One is to have a cue and have the motor pull commands from the queue, which is called a uh, back pressure. Um, yeah, Walter's asking about uh, learning. And so uh, uh, the answer is uh, yes, in that uh, you, um, you need closed loop control. You need feedback for the machine learning, which can be with uh, encoders. It can be with a vision system. But a, a growing subject is machine learning in machines, where you have the machines actually learn how to control themselves. But the uh, increasingly in machine building, we don't build central controllers, we build machine networks. So you then need to get a command to the machine. So I, I had mentioned in machining week, uh, the most common one is G codes, this ancient standard. Uh, uh, that's sort of well past its uh, due date. And then this is what I had shown a, um, uh, so Ricardo, the advantage of the machine learning is if you make a machine and for example, uh, so the very first thing is you need to learn the profiles for accelerating and deaccelerating. So rather than you specifying them, one, one part of machine learning is for the machine learning to do those pro profiles. Then when you make a machine, it needs to know, for example, how a step of the stepper corresponds to the motion in real space. So it needs to calibrate for that. Then uh, it needs to know how the axes are connected. There's many different architectures. That's the kinematics. Then there's the dynamics. For example, when you get to a corner, you need to slow down and accelerate and so all of those are things that you um, have to write into a controller. Those are benefits of um, having the machine learn about machining. So a tiny G takes a G code in and does everything I just described. It interprets it. So the tiny G needs a complete description of the machine. Uh, in, in the networks I'll describe shortly, we do that in software. Uh, you're going to need to make a user interface. So Chili Pepper is an example of a nice uh, open interface uh, for machines. You're going to need to plan the path. So if you go back to mods, uh, this was an example of when you, when you machine a toolpath. One of the reasons I wrote mods is so you can see what's going on. And so uh, this module thresholds the design. This finds the difference to the edges. This one offsets for the size of the tool. This finds the edges, this orients them, this turns them into strokes, and this coordinates them. So if you go back to mods and you actually look at the graph, you can see all the steps that are going into the path planning. So once you've done all of this, then we need to build the machine. There are a number of vendors that support this. So Open Builds, Robot Shop, uh, O-Drive, all make versions of uh, all of the parts I'm describing uh, as kits for machine building. Many of these you can make in Fab Labs, but those are commercial vendors. Then, this is going to be all about the motors. And so we really care about the motors for this. So for example, Stepper Online is a, a big vendor of all sorts of stepper motors. Uh, but one of the things to know is that it's surprisingly easy to customize motors. So again, thanks to our friends in Shenzhen, you can get all sorts of motors with fixed specifications. But if you want a motor with a particular size torque, you might want a threaded rod, uh, uh, lead screw. It's surprisingly easy to order batches of custom motors from these vendors. They have a low overhead to do that. 
then this next sequence is lots of different options for the motor controllers. So uh, Pololu, for example, makes handy boards uh, of motor controllers. Uh, Ramps is a standard one. Um, these are a number of standard boards for motor controls. Uh, they're they're uh, fixed in what they do, but they're widely used, um, well-supported. So if what you're doing is similar to what they support, um, you can use these standard motor control boards. Then uh, 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 these next ones are just a couple of many examples of uh, the, these are motor control boards that are designed to be made in labs. So uh, this is like the ones I was showing you, but this is a motor controller. See, this is one from Jake. Uh, this is one from Quentin. Uh, these are motor controllers using the motor control chips I showed you with nice interfaces designed to go right on the uh, standard motor designs. So uh, it's now quite easy to make these in the lab. Now we come to arch some architectural projects. So I've been interested in simplifying machine building. If we go back to tiny G, there's a huge amount of code running in there. Most mortals don't look at that code, but there's a lot of configuration you need to do to set it up. So Arumbu is a project that started, this is a paper on it, that started at a meeting of the Fab Academy instructors in Kerala just before the pandemic. Um, and Arumbu is a small ant that lives in the south of India. And the spirit of Arumbu is what are the small ants of machine building? And so what it's based on is Here's a series of modules for the Arumbu project Quentin made. Each of them is using the SAMD11, which is the $1 microcontroller with USB. USB3 gives you about one amp, 900 milliamps, which is enough to move a moderate sized motor. And it can, uh, this processor can talk at 10 megabits. So we have a 10 megabit connection and uh, we have about an amp. So then if we go to Amazon USB 3 hub, uh, 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 motors need power supplies, but one of the handy things is if you take something like this $40 USB hub, uh, each port is giving you five volts at uh, about one amp. And then it has um, uh, seven of those data ports plus four charging ports. And so that's about um, 50 watts of power. And so a powered hub gives you power for each degree of freedom and data. And so that led to the idea of as one way to build motors, uh, one way to build a machine architecture, uh, if we take each axis of the machine that has a motor, um, we give it a USB interface. The USB interface brings data and power to it, and we plug it into a USB hub. So we use USB for both the data and the power. And so that then led to the question of how well that works. So this was a test I did of, if we get to this image, what I'm doing is, uh, this is the USB hub. Um, I, I'm plugging it into USB on a computer and then I'm running a Python program. And what the Python program is doing is sending packets. And here what I'm showing is um, each of these pulses 
is, is a packet of data. And I'm sending the packets of data out on four different ports to four different nodes. And so in software, I'm running a program that's generating these packets and it's sending them out through US, through the stack to USB to these nodes. And what this is showing is um, the timing here is a, a tenth of a millisecond. And so the, 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 the variability in the arrival time of these packets is uh, better than a tenth of a millisecond. And so the reason we care about that is in a stepper motor, depending on how much you're stepping, the stepping rate might be a few thousand steps a second. It can be higher in a very high performance machine. But at a few thousand steps per second, it means we can do that in software. So here then was a test I did where, um, if we do this one, um, let's see if I turn up this volume, so you'll, you'll hear what sounds like uh, music almost. What's happening is in software, I'm sending steps to the motors. And in the code, it, it's, it's comically simple. Um, all the motor knows how to do is it gets a command to either make a forward step or a backward step. So the motor code is completely trivial. It just says, make one step, then in software, what I'm doing is I'm figuring out when I want the motors to make steps. And in a Python program, uh, I'm running a Python program, and the Python program is sending steps out to the motors. And then uh, this was just a test to see that I'm running these four motors in parallel. But here, I've gotten rid of all of the embedded code, and I'm just sending individual steps to them. So this, this is maximally simple machine building with ultra simple nodes, where with a simple Python program, uh, you send packets to, to the nodes. And then Quentin went ahead and added lots of other versions. So this is a sensor, this is distance, ADC, a potentiometer, a power transistor. Uh, this is a servo and a stepper. And so with the USB hub, and these modules that that lets you make the control architecture and distribute the um, power, and in fact, uh, in the mods project recently, Yanni and Fran added uh, Arumbu modules that talk to these nodes from a browser using Web Serial directly. Um, let's see, to Arumbu. So all of that is Arumbu. Then Arumbu inspired this related project that Quentin and my student Jake and um, Leo and other colleague worked on. Um, this, for example, is a, this was a fun project. Um, um, let's get to, actually, I yeah, know this is relevant to show this. So what this does is in a rumbu, the nodes are completely trivial. Uh, this is a little more complex. We're here. Um, as you add the nodes, they, they contain descriptions. So as you plug in the nodes, the computer recognizes them. It knows what it is and what it knows how to do. And then you write little scripts that connect them. And so uh, this example. Let's see, I want to hear the xylophone. So this is an example of a xylophone being played um, by this modular things framework. Um, these are drawing machines, pancake machines, other machines using, the, using that. So a rumbu takes away all of the complexity. Um, modular things has slightly more complex nodes that know how they work. 
But again, these are designed to be really easy to make in Fab Labs with these simple nodes. So uh, this is what I recommend you use as uh, the control architecture in your machine rather than a fixed controller. And then from there, Fab 2.0 is the goal of Fab Labs making Fab Labs. There's a video of the recitation of all of these machine builders talking about their machine building here. And uh, it includes uh, my student Jake's Clank or modular machines, Nadia's uh, tool changing machines. Uh, uh, Jens in Norway has been making a whole family of large format machines that he makes in the lab. And then uh, Danielle in Hamburg has been leading a team that's been doing a fabulous job making all the machines in a fab lab uh, with open designs. And so this is uh, uh, their link to a complete kit of fab lab tools uh, with open designs. And then finally, the machine builders I've told you about have also started a number of companies. So uh, Alan, for example, started uh, Shaper Tools. Um, uh, Nadia and Jonathan's work uh, turned into, after a couple steps, uh, Bantam tools, Max's became uh, Form Labs. So along with these open designs, these are a number of commercial machines uh, that have been spun off from the machine builders. And then at your convenience, these are links to Joseph and Simone uh, have a, a great history of building uh, comical machines, not, not practical machines, but machines that do uh, very entertaining things. So the second part of class was stepping back from the architecture of the machine to the mechanisms, to the power electronics, to the communication, to the control coordination, uh, up to the application. And so the second part of the assignment is in the first part, you made the mechanism. Now I want you to actuate it and automate it and uh, document it. And then I realize for next week, for the review, I want to try to do something. Let me make a note of this. Uh, rather than a random review, uh, we're going to have no class next week. And then for the class after that, what I'd like to do is quickly see all of the machines. So uh, your labs all have lab pages. And so if we take, say, Barcelona, ah, OK. Uh, Barcelona is, is ahead. Uh, what I want you to do is, on each of your lab pages, have a link to your machine project. And then in the class after the break, we're going to quickly go through each one. Uh, if, if you have time, let's see, there's about, oh, 70 labs. So we can only spend a minute or two per lab. But if, if possible, you can quickly do a live demo. But I'll go to your lab page and we'll see what you did in the machine. So try to make a demo clip. If you can have the machine ready, but try to make a demo clip. And then on your lab page, uh, put in a link to your machine. And after the break, we'll do a world tour and see what all you made. So this is one of the most fun weeks, two weeks. It, it's a, we spread it out over two weeks to make it sane. Uh, it's one of the most creative weeks. It ties together many of the skills so far in the class. And it's also an invitation into this Fab 2.0 transition to really get you thinking about making a lab, not buying a lab. OK, final questions or comments. Uh, Adrian is saying global open time is this week. Uh, and we'll skip uh, next week. And once again, I covered a lot today. After 
the, the last hour, you're not an expert in machine building. The goal of two weeks is an introduction. The, the, the real goal of this assignment is for you to see all the steps from, 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 from the machine back to the control system and see how all they come together. Uh, and then, yeah, for students that are separate, you can collaborate beyond labs. So uh, as I keep saying, go to the class issue tracker and uh, you start start an issue for machine collaboration, and you're welcome to collaborate between labs on machines as long as you can document what you did. Um, Jason? Yeah, I just had a question about um, the, the assignment itself, where yep. we're supposed to be able to demonstrate manual movement. Uh, as far for our group, we're building a dust collector. <laughs> um, so there's kind of suction involved, and I'm not sure how to manually demonstrate that portion. Oh, it may not be relevant to you. Um, okay. uh, meaning the, the only part there would just be, uh, I, I love it if you're making a dust collector, but you want to make sure that it spins freely. OK. Um, ju ju just, just that you know the, the bearings are working, it's not binding. Um, it's more relevant to once you start having multiple axes if they're mis misaligned, for example, the whole machine can bind and you can't move it. It, uh, it it's, it's less relevant to what you're doing. Gotcha. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't an issue where we followed the spirit of the law, but not the letter. And then... no, no, not at all. OK. But yeah, use the issue tracker if you want to collaborate between labs, if, if, if people are separated, with the one requirement that um, you do need to document both what you do individually, your contribution, and then what you do collectively. OK, this should be a really fun cycle. And I'll say goodbye, and I'll see you in two weeks. So happy machine building. Bye-bye. Bye.